1971, Bangladesh war and the decisive victory by the Indian army transformed Prime Minister Indira Gandhi into a deity. She was compared to the goddess Durga. In the euphoria of victory, the Congress swept the polls in the 1972 assembly elections. Both in the center and the states, it was preeminent. The Congress by now had been shaped to reflect her personality and preferences. Yet, just two years later, Indira Gandhi was to face her most serious political challenge. One that would force the daughter of India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, to jeopardize the very fate and future of Indian democracy itself. Raj Narayan, the socialist candidate who stood against Indira from Raibareli in the 1971 elections, launched a case against her over election irregularities. Four years later, at the Allahabad High Court, Justice Jagmohan Sinha was ready to deliver his judgment on the 12th of June, 1975. I treat every judgment and every case alike. I never thought that it was a historic judgment. Because if, I, if a judge thinks that this is a very important case, then it can sway his judgment. It was a historic judgment nonetheless. One that found Indira Gandhi guilty on two counts of electoral malpractice. It invalidated Indira's election and disbarred her from office for six years. Raj Narayan stood triumph in front of the world press. The people rejoice and reaffirm their faith in the democratic institutions of India. I accept the judgment with humility. This judgment came at a time when the opposition had launched a major campaign against Indira Gandhi, accusing her government of rampant corruption. It was led by the aging patriarch Jayaprakash Narayan. The student-based Sampoon Kranti movement had been gathering strength for months. Every day in cities across the country, Opposition parties had been staging protest rallies against Mrs. Gandhi's rule. The country was coming to a standstill. Sensing the moment was right, the opposition went in for the kill. At the time of her supreme political crisis, Mrs. Gandhi turned to her younger son, Sanjay, for support and advice. Justice Sinha had granted a stay order for 20 days to give the government time to appoint a new Prime Minister. Sanjay Gandhi and his supporters used this time to arrange demonstrations of support and loyalty. They convinced Indira to fight back. By one judge in a high court pronouncing a judgment and the opposition of that time saying that uh, that is the end of the matter and we won't wait and Mrs. Gandhi must go uh, was what we were agitating against. On the 20th of June, 1975, Indira Gandhi's lawyers filed an appeal in the Supreme Court, while Mrs. Gandhi defiantly addressed a massive gathering at the boat club in Delhi. It is my duty to see that nothing is done anywhere in any corner of the world which can cast any reflection on this character of the Indian people. Indira Gandhi has been On the evening of 25th June, the opposition parties announced countrywide protests to force Mrs. Gandhi's resignation. The call was given to commence an agitation in every part of India. Which government could possibly tolerate a situation of this kind, when not only the people have been asked to revolt, but it is said that the army and the police should treat this as their own struggle. Siddharth Shankar Ray helped Indira draft a proclamation. He declared that a grave emergency exists whereby the security of India is threatened by internal disturbances. Then she said, uh, then we should go to the president. I said, yes. Then she said, you come. We were with the president, maybe about two hours, one and a half hours. She explained the facts to him. The president showed him the reports and everything. 
as to what the position was and what the latest uh, appeal was to the people. What do we do about it? And then I took over. I explained the law in that emergency for internal disturbance can be declared uh, if the danger was imminent. The president, Fakhruddin Ali Ahmad, signed it just before midnight. And for the first time since independence, a state of emergency was declared. Fundamental rights of the citizen were suspended. And Mrs. Gandhi, in effect, became a dictator. opposition figures had been rounded up in the dead of night. JP was arrested. 600 other opposition leaders, including Muraji Desai and LK Advani, were also arrested. Jay Prakash Ji has been arrested, Muraji Bhai has been arrested. And then we consulted Vajpayee Ji and myself. And we decided to await the police arrival and to leave. So they came at about 7.30 or so and picked us up. Back in Delhi, just after midnight, members of Indira Gandhi's cabinet were woken up by a phone call. They were told to attend a meeting at six o'clock in the morning. The state of emergency declared in the country was to be retrospectively endorsed by the cabinet. She called her cabinet and informed her about this. And cabinet approved wholly, without any objection. Nobody objected. She pointed out everything, threadbare, as to why this was necessary. So this is how it happened. That night, power was cut off from Bahadur Shah Zafar Marg, the Fleet Street of India, where the offices of almost all the major national dailies are located. Censorship was imposed on the press. The emergency was declared, and there was complete pandemonium in the Times of India office. People didn't know what to do, because we were not used to censorship of the press. And this has been, we were given notices that nothing was to publish unless it had been cleared by the censor. When I discussed it with great length, and she wouldn't agree with me at all, she said there can be no uh, emergency, uh, no set press freedom with emergency. They have to toe the line. But the emergency placed extraordinary power in the hands of an extra-constitutional authority. A man largely seen as reckless and arrogant, Sanjay Gandhi had gathered around him a bunch of aggressive cohorts who to many people were nothing more than unruly, undisciplined muscle men. It was obvious that Mrs. Gandhi's youngest son was being groomed for higher things. He was the star attraction in the Mammoth Youth Congress rally held in New Delhi's Pravati Maidan in 1976. In the Gauhati All India Congress Committee meet, Mrs. Gandhi went a step further. She declared, the Youth Congress has stolen our thunder. At that time, the Youth Congress was playing a very active role. We had a very concrete program. And it was a new generation of youth coming in. So it was a new resurgence in the polity of the country. In Guwahati, uh, it was Youth Congress. For the first time, you saw so many Youth Congress banners. You saw so many Youth Congress workers from all over the country. And uh, many of the very older leaders looked alien there. They started looking that, what is this happening? Her official blessings on Sanjay as an alternative power center was the signal for the Youth Congress Brigade to unleash what turned out to be a reign of terror. Inevitable stories of excesses began to surface. In the name of beautification, the capital's Turkman Gate area was bulldozed. Its occupants relocated. But it was the forced sterilization campaign in the name of family planning which gave the emergency its overriding stigma. Sanjay's meteoric rise was helped by the fact that the opposition was silenced, its leaders under arrest, and strict censorship in force. The ruthlessness of the regime came out when George Fernandez, who had gone underground, 
was finally arrested and produced in court in handcuffs. It's not just the handcuffs. It was handcuffs and chains. Used to be every day when I used to be brought to the court. I and my colleagues used to be brought to the court. We were 22 of us and as we were... Uh, every morning we had to be brought to the court when the trial began or earlier in the, when, when dates were taken. At that time, plus a chain with which uh, two policemen chained themselves to me and similarly to other colleagues. That was Mrs. Gandhi's way of telling you that, uh, you know, how I can crush you. On the 18th of January, 1977, Mrs. Gandhi, with her instinct for the dramatic, surprised the world by making an unscheduled broadcast to the nation, announcing an end to the 19-month-long emergency. Fresh elections were announced. Insulated from the public mood, Indira Gandhi had underestimated hatred of the emergency and the opposition strategy. Jagdeevan Ram, the powerful Dalit leader in Indira's cabinet, was the first to revolt. He was joined by H.N. Bahuguna, former UP chief minister who had fallen out with Sanjay Gandhi. His resignation from the Congress party electrified the political atmosphere. Four non-communist parties merged with the Janata party under the ascetic Muraji Desai, though JP remained its lodestar. Two months later, in a stunning election outcome, Mrs. Gandhi was swept out of power. Well, uh, well, she got a terrible drubbing from no one less than a buffoon, I think Rajnara, and Sanjay uh, lost two. And I came to see them when she was now in a different house and very woebegone, looked very sad. And I asked her, Mrs. Gandhi, ye kya hua? She said, we feedback nahi tha. Because she'd been told the feedback she got was that uh, she was very popular and would sweep the polls. This is her own uh, government uh, information agencies. So I said to her, Mrs. Gandhi, feedback kaise hota? Apne press ko to band kar diya. Muraji Desai, heading a motley collection of opposition parties, was sworn in as Prime Minister. The Janta Party, already riven by dissension, took yet another vow at Rajghat, the Samadhi of Mahatma Gandhi. Mrs. Gandhi's humiliating defeat was clearly more to do with the excesses of the emergency than popular support for the Janta Party. The flood of exposures in the media had laid the blame for those excesses on the so-called Gang of Four. Sanjay, architect and the chief enforcer of the mass sterilization program. Bansi Lal, defense minister, and Sanjay's hatchet man. Minister of State for Home, Om Mehta, who, on Sanjay's orders, orchestrated the mass arrests of politicians and journalists. And V.C. Shukla, the arrogant minister for information and broadcasting, who enforced censorship rules with an iron hand. Everything was done according to law. Even press censorship was done according to law. The law may be bad. Emergency was promulgated that much bad, but there were under certain provisions of the constitution, which were later on deleted. But uh, they were under law of the land at that particular moment, that time. They were not illegal acts, or they were not high-handed acts uh, against the law. Within months, however, the Janta Party was in crisis. Indira Gandhi began to attract supporters again. In July 1977, in Belchi, a remote village in Bihar, local landlords had massacred whole families of landless Harijans. While the government dithered, Indira Gandhi decided to visit the village. All parts to Belchi had been washed away by the monsoon rains, and hardly had she covered any distance when her jeep got stuck. Mrs. Gandhi then started her march on foot. She had walked a few kilometers when Moti the elephant came to her rescue. After three and a half hours, with the sun setting behind her, Indira Gandhi reached Belchi. 
the survivors of the massacre came running out of the village to greet her. She was with them for a short while, but by the time her cavalcade started the march back, the enthusiastic response from the crowds could mean only one thing. Mrs. Gandhi was on the comeback trail. Indira's return to strength infuriated the government. This provoked Chaudhary Charan Singh, the Home Minister, who ordered the arrest of Mrs. Gandhi on the 3rd of October 1977. When the CBI and the police arrived at 12 Willingdon Crescent, she made them wait for several hours, then insisted on being handcuffed. Our first reaction, even Sanjay's reaction was that they come to arrest him. But the police was in hundreds and there was, I think, Mrs. Kiran Bedi there also with them. At the gate they had a net, as if, you know, they would fly off or something. And then we realized, I mean, Sanjay went and talked to the officers concerned. And they said they have come to arrest Mrs. Gandhi. Now they didn't have a warrant of arrest, so Sanjay ji, I mean, he said that you can't arrest unless you have a warrant of arrest for her. And then in the meantime, he gave me a list of MPs and journalists to contact. God, because they cut the phones in the house. Her supporters soon mobbed the house. Mrs. Gandhi's histrionics showed that her legendary political instincts were still intact. It also gave Sanjay Gandhi and his activists another opportunity to flex their muscles. When she eventually left the house at 7.30 in the evening, she was showered with rose petals by the cheering crowd. The police car headed towards Haryana followed by Sanjay Gandhi and her supporters. At Lakhpur Havid, before the Haryana River was crossed, there was a level crossing that was closed and railway train was going to go. But the whole thing had to stop there. Realizing that she was being taken outside the jurisdiction of a Delhi warrant, Mrs. Gandhi got out of the car and sat on the ground surrounded by her lawyers and supporters. After the level crossing was opened, uh, they were requesting her to uh, come and sit in the jeep, which she refused. She, she wouldn't sit in the jeep, unless the jeep was turned and she was taken back to Delhi. So this uh, one Mr. N.K. Singh, he tried to grab her wrist and her arm to take her forcibly, and she uh, scolded him very, very strongly. And everybody uh, said that we'll... Uh, will kill you if you touch her like this and all that. The motorcade turned back to Delhi. The Janta government had committed its first major political blunder and its greatest administrative blunder. The next day, Indira Gandhi was produced in court. Outside the court, Sanjay and his gangs battled with the police and Janta party supporters. The case against Mrs. Gandhi was that she had entered into a criminal conspiracy with industrial houses to provide her and her son Sanjay with jeeps for their election campaign. Inside the court, the judge dismissed the case. Mrs. Gandhi was free. Meanwhile, in another court, witnesses and depositions were piling up as the Shah Commission began its inquiry into the excesses of the emergency. Sanjay was made to appear to hear the allegations against him. I accompanied him and Menaka to the Shah Commission. As Sanjay entered, there was free fall. It broke loose, chairs, tables, everything. We hurled at each other. Uh, I took shelter behind uh, Kiran Bedi. She, she asked me, Ke mere ke And I saw this fight go on. And Sanjay fought back. I couldn't believe. And they tore his shirt. And he hit back. He's a very powerful man. He was short, but he's very powerful. And um, within 10 minutes, uh, Sanjay, of course, had carried his goons with him too. They got the better of the others and threw them out of the court. And the charming incident was that while all this was going on and Justice Shah hadn't come on this, from his chambers to the room, Menaka leapt over the railing uh, which separated the courtroom from the judge's chair and table 
and she picked up two of his pens, you know, with, from the holder and uh, gave them to me as mementos. I had them for many years with me. It was the Supreme Court, however, which decided that Sanjay Gandhi deserved to be in the same place he had put hundreds of his opponents, in Tihar jail. The case, notoriously called the Kissa Kursika case, one in which a satirical film had been banned and its negatives destroyed, was, ironically, one that had aroused the least public and media interest. Sanjay was eventually released amid high drama and familiar disruptions by his supporters. Thirty-four months after her worst ever electoral defeat, Mrs. Gandhi stormed back as Prime Minister in the 1980 elections. But this was a new Congress party, one where Sanjay and his cronies called the shots. What effect Sanjay's power would have on Indian politics would never be known.